I think it's uh, time to start now. So thank you for joining us for um, a new class in Drisha's series on work and rest. Um, a newly uh, minted doctor, Sarah Zager, is uh, going to be teaching today. Um, oh no, I think I am probably frozen. Um, <laughs> Did you catch any of that? I'm so sorry. At least I got most of that. So I think you're okay. good. Your video was a little choppy, but on my end, okay. but I think you're doing great. Okay, uh, good to hear. So uh, yeah, so uh, Dr. Zager is going to be um, bringing us through some sources uh, from rabbinic texts to uh, modern Jewish texts on, um, on domestic labor. Uh, we were talking a bit, little bit earlier about how, you know, it can be a, a fraught topic and I'm sure will lead to um, uh, some really interesting uh, conversation and yeah, take it away. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Maxine. Um, just a few notes before we start. Um, the first is that while uh, I know that everyone's attendance at Zoom Shirim takes place in different parts of your life and in different intersects differently with domestic labor, as we will be talking about today. Um, I really invite you to turn on your camera. It's really delightful to see your smiling faces, even if you are in the midst of various kinds of uh, domestic and household labor. Part of the goal of this year is to understand the interface between those two things. Um, a brief map of where we will be headed over the course of the next three sessions. Um, we're going to start with a discussion of the relationship, maybe tense, maybe kind of co-productive co um, between uh, Torah study and domestic labor, um, focusing both on childcare and on other kinds of like keeping your household in order. Um, and then we will turn to instead of thinking about kind of the, the interaction between different demands on our time, what actually is the kind of psychological, emotional work that um, specifically childcare labor does on us. Um, and then finally, in the last session, we'll talk a little bit about the implications of hiring someone else to do your domestic labor. So that's sort of the broad overview. Um, and I think by the end of this, I will hope to kind of complicate the thesis that these two areas of life have sort of Judaism kind of writ large on the one hand and domestic labor on the other, either don't, don't have some, or either the same thing or don't have something to say to each other. Um, both, I'm gonna kind of refute both of those theses and replace them with hopefully a more complicated and interesting picture. So with that said, I invite everyone to do the following. Write in the chat a brief phrase or a word or a couple of words about the that come to mind when you think about the relationship between Torah study and domestic labor, i.e., childcare, other kinds of household upkeep, etc. If you're here as an attendee, I believe you can still do that as well. Okay, cool, teach my kids Parsha, beautiful. So there's sort of two main ideas I'm seeing pop up in the chat, um, if I can paraphrase Noah's uh, emojis. Um, on the one hand, sort of one really direct point of contact between, um, between uh, like domestic labor and Talmud Torah is Talmud Torah as a form of childcare, right? Or as a way of, um, you know, building a life with your children and teaching them certain kinds of things. That's certainly one sort of like kind of hopefully in its best moments, like co-equal, co-productive moment. Um, and then Noah's emoji expresses a sense of like, this is a really fraught and complex relationship. And one actually that might be seen as kind of directly in competition with one another. Great. Um, yeah. So Right. Desmond is pointing to this sense that like, if you want to take care of the kids and you want to deal with all the stuff going on, then you're going to miss some of the main like kind of communal Talmud Torah 
Um, that that idea and, and the sort of gendered way that you've talked about it is something we're going to see tonight. But I think by the end of this year, we're going to get some other models for thinking about how this relationship might go. So keep those those ideas in mind um, as we as we go forward. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. As one does at this juncture. Oh no, Maxine host has dis disabled sharing for me. Ah, beautiful. I am now the co-host. Baruch Hashem. Cool. Everybody see the source sheet. Give me a thumbs up if you see the source sheet to know that you're alive. Great. Wonderful. So we are going to start with what I would say is kind of like the grand have I mean, about this relationship that we're then going to like introduce a maskana to reject or to complicate, right? So often in like rabbinic argumentation, there's a like general idea of like the wrong thing you might be led to think, and then a more complicated picture that emerges after that. So I didn't say this is totally wrong, but it's it's a it's a picture we're going to complicate, but it's one that's really like strongly in the literature and strongly uh, cited by lots of modern people when they want to talk about it. So this is this is one of the sort of famous passages about a potential conflict between uh, between Torah learning and child care. Can I get somebody to read? John, can I impose on you to read in a language sure. of your selection? I choose English. Great, <clears throat> beautiful. Rabbi Yaakov says, it is as though he diminishes the divine image as it is stated. Uh, okay, before you before you do this, one one very brief um, a brief introduction. Actually, what are we talking about? We're talking about the discussion of someone who refuses to have children or just doesn't. Right? What what what's what what's the kind of the how do we understand someone who doesn't engage in the mitzvah of priyaruvia of being fruitful and multiplying? Great. A little context you needed. Go ahead. So Rabbi Yaakov says, it is as though he diminishes the divine image, as it is stated, for in the image of God he made man. And it is written immediately afterward, and you be fruitful and multiply. Ben Azai says, it is as though he sheds blood and also diminishes the divine image, as it is stated, and you be fruitful and multiply, after the verse that alludes to both shedding blood and the divine image. They said to Ben Azai, there is a type of scholar who expounds well and fulfills his own teachings well, and another who fulfills well and does not expound well. But you, who have never married, expound well on the importance of procreation, and yet you do not fulfill well your own, <clears throat> um, uh, your own teachings. But as I said to them, what shall I do as my soul yearns for Torah and I do not wish to deal with anything else? It is possible for the world to be maintained by others who are engaged in the mitzvah to be fruitful and multiply. Beautiful. Okay, so the, just be a little careful with the, the Steinsaltz inter, interpolations that are not in bold, right? Especially, I don't want to deal with anything else. But what do you think is behind Med Azai's statement, right? My soul learns for Torah as a response to this critique, right? Which is like, well, you say one thing and you do another. Why does he want to, why, did, why does he say that? What's the, what's the kind of assumption about the relationship between childcare and, yeah, Kelsey. Oh, you gotta unmute. That childcare will be a distraction or domestic life will be a distraction to Torah learning. Great, there's something incompatible, right? And so when he says, I'm so drawn to this, that's an excuse because obviously being totally all in on the project of Torah to such a sense that the, like that is like what's taking up your emotional life your psychological life, your time, means that you can't engage in the tasks that would be assumed with childcare. Now, one thing we're going to talk about a lot more next week is what kinds of childcare do we think the rabbis are actually doing or not doing? Um, we'll leave that open for the moment. Um, but let's just say that that's, that's a question that should be on the table in the back of our minds is like assuming that it's maybe not the same picture as we, as we might have of a you know, fathers being like super involved in, in children's lives now. But nonetheless, right, the idea is there's something about a marriage and then having children that is incompatible with a full focus on Talmud Torah. That's, that's the sort of initial assumption that this text makes. And as we'll see, it gets sort of carried down. So 
just so you get a taste of the halachic literature on this topic, um, the Maimonides in the Mishnah Torah basically codifies this statement with not a lot of extra baggage around it. I got someone else to read. You can read in English. It's okay. Otherwise, I'm going to see. All right. Okay. When is a man, a person? Well, okay. We'll leave that gender terminology in this translation for the moment, but recognize its, its problems. Um, obligated in this mitzvah, i.e. the mitzvah of, of uh, procreation, from the age of 17. Once he reaches the age of 20 years and has not married, he has tr transgressed and neglected a positive commandment. However, if he is involved in Torah and engrossed in it, and he fears that if he marries, he will have to busy himself with supporting a wife. Notice what the Rambam has supplied as the, the thing that's going to get in the way. It's not really child care. It's actually the economic piece of taking care of a family more than the like kind of changing diapers piece. But nonetheless, um, it's permissible for him to delay getting married. For one who is involved in a mitzvah is exempt from another mitzvah and all the more so regarding Torah study. Okay, so this already seems to be kind of in the world of Ben Azai, but then it gets even stronger, right? One who is in love with Torah and studies it and cleaves to it always as Ben Azai did, commits no sin thereby. I.e., it's okay if you're like Ben Azai, that's a model that's available to you, even if it's a model that might be um, problematic or might be one that we don't, we don't you know, kind of generally say is the model that everyone should endorse. But actually there's something about the kind of mutually exclusive nature of these two goods that means that pursuing each of them, if some people pursue each of them, that's kind of an acceptable way to go about things. Ah, beautiful. Okay. Um, anyone just want to react to how he's codified this here? I think the main thing to see is just that this gets brought brought down in lots of halakhic literature and kind of is still with us. Yeah? Okay, great. So just to see one other place where the this text kind of comes into modern imagination, um, I wanna share with you one of my favorite 19th century Lithuanian Jewish wacky texts, um, which as you'll discover over the course of this year, I have a, a penchant for. So. It's, it's a text from uh, Baruch Levi Epstein, sometimes known as the Torah Tamima. Um, he, his kind of main work is this commentary on the Torah where he take, he collects all of the places where a given verse is quoted in rabbinic literature, and then he comments on those quotations and how they're reading the verse. Highly recommend, it's an amazing work on its own. He has also written an extensive autobiography. And in that autobiography, he discusses his relationship with his aunt, who was herself a real, like, kind of tell me that hachamim, and a really um, bizarre character for 19th century Jewry in that way. Um, and he it records his dialogues with her, um, some of which are rather fraught. Um, they're not, I would say, like most scholars agree that they're not kind of, rec he presents them as sort of text of a conversation that he's had, as a sort of script. Likely it's not a good transcript of any interaction he ever had with this person, but it does seem to suggest that, that there were learned women in this period um, and that he, he had interaction with them. So um, it's a fascinating little historical piece, but what I'm actually most interested in for this purpose as a sort of seeing how this idea filters into the modern Jewish imagination um, is his initial description of what his aunt was like and the way that Talmud Torah and household labor kind of interact um, in his description of her. Cool. So he's, he's just going to start talking about what it was like to see his aunt. And he says the following thing. Such was her way to sit always near the winter oven in the kitchen or even, even during the summer with all sorts of stuff spread out, books spread out before on the table. Bible, Mishnayot, and Yaakov, which is a collection of kind of the agudic or narrative parts of rabbinic literature with various commentaries. Um, various Midrashim, Minorata, Ma'or, Kav HaYashjar, Tzamech Shevet Yehuda, whole list of kind of 
the, the big books of the moment, and many other books of this nature, including volumes of Agada. All of her focus and concentration was on the books. Her hand hardly moved from them. But of the maintenance of the household, she knew little, almost nothing. So he's just, whatever, whatever actually the reality is about her, he's described her as someone who essentially like fits the male stereotype rather than the female stereotype. And because part of his way of telling you that she's so deeply entrenched in the world of Torah is actually to tell you that she doesn't know how to run a house. And there's something for, I think, kind of implicitly here, just to read, read a little heavily into it, about the idea that like these two things cannot go together. If there's sort of two different realms of knowledge and what's remarkable and weird about this woman is that she sort of moves into the quote unquote Ron category, right? So you can see that, whereas for Ben Azai, there's a sort of like, these are this Talmud Torah and child rearing just can't go together. There's something potentially incompatible in the modern imagination, that incompatibility compatibility gets really gendered and it gets sort of divided up into this like male role, female role. And then when we wanna talk about someone kind of crossing, crossing the boundary, queering the boundary in some way, we're gonna talk about it in terms of, um, we're gonna kind of signal that shift by saying she's got one kind of knowledge, but not the other. Thoughts, reactions, questions before we move on. I noticed there's some stuff in the chat. Great. Um, interesting that there's no, so Ozzy writes, interesting there's no Gemara in her, his aunt's learning. So yeah, he doesn't list Gemara here. However, when he actually records the transcript, it becomes very obvious that at least in his imagination, she knows a lot of Gemara. Um, and she's quoting Gemara all the time. She even at one point, like they get into an argument. He brings the Yerushalmi. And she's like, you don't get to paskin from the Yerushalmi. Um, so she seems to be, you know, you should paskin from this Babli instead. So she seems really quite literate in that stuff, but he doesn't describe it in that way. Yes. Um, it's also true that in this period, it was pretty common for uh, male rabbis to delay marriage much later. And there's good literature on like how they justified that within the paradigm, but often it was by appeal to this like Ben Azai logic. Good. Any other thoughts or questions? Yeah, Kelsey. I don't know. I think this, I don't know if this really like adds anything, but um, a while ago I was working on something and came across um, like a like a little potted bio of um, the rabbi, uh, what's his name? Yosef Yozel Horowitz, who like barricaded himself in his room. He had had, he was married and had children, but then I think his wife died and he like negotiated with his father-in-law to like take his kids so that he could be barricaded in his room and only study Torah. But I think it's important to note that like, even as a man, like this was not taken well by the community. They like essentially hounded him out of this room and eventually he had to come out. And I think then he founded a yeshiva later in, at some point after this, but it wasn't like, oh, okay. You know, it, even, it was right. like, this is a bridge too far, you know, I guess so. So yeah. there is and, on the men, on men too, to some degree. Right, and there's this, there's this very complicated back and forth, especially in the like kind of 19th century Eastern Europe, about the relationship between, on the one hand, the idea that, you know, kind of especially, right, just like a little historical note, in the 19th century, early 19th century, um, with the rise of like what we now know as the modern yeshiva, um, that there was a, a an in, especially like by the time of the gra, like kind of things progress at pace, but by the time of the gra, there's such intense focus on Talmud study as not only kind of the only textual thing you're doing, but often the only thing you're doing, right? And you're doing it through the night and you're not sleeping in any, like what we would recognize as a like, you know, eight hour pattern. All of those kinds of pictures of what Talmud Torah looks like then become really, um, really become kind of complicated by also an intense focus on family, right? And that that's part of what is constantly negotiated. Um, certainly like very famously, the Gra also had like often did not see his children or his wife for very long stretches and had like a complicated relationship. 
uh, to them as well. So, you know, I, I'm bringing you this in part because it gives you a picture of like a woman crossing a boundary, which is in itself really interesting. Um, but it, it's part of a much wider, uh, wider kind of cultural cult, set of cultural phenomena. Great. Okay. So this is this initial picture, which basically says these two things are in competition, and there's often very little that can be done to bring them together. You have to choose. That's the model in some way. Okay. Um, before we go on, does anyone like, I, I'm just interested in people's like actual honest reactions to this model. So maybe if you kind of in the same way, you can write in the chat, like how you feel about this model. You're like, I love it. I hate it. It seems true. It seems crazy to me. It seems like just so present in the culture. There's nothing I could possibly do to get around it. So like, here we are. Thoughts, questions. You could write in the chat. You can say words with your words directly, whatever you'd like. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, to yeah. your, sorry, uh, to your most uh, recent question. Yeah. Um, I guess just, this is reminding me of something that I, uh, you know, kind of happened uh, last week, but it always just is so, heartwarming when I see people um like learning Toro while like holding a baby <laughs> it's just like I don't know just yeah the sweetest thing to me <laughs> so I'm not a big fan of this bifurcation right so like it's worth I mean we, we said at the somebody at the big few people at the beginning talked about you know the potential connection between childcare and learning and there's something you lose out on if you have this model, right? You lose out on an opportunity for those for those two things to kind of interpen interpenetrate in a deeper way. Um, yeah. So John, I think you're right about this polygamy thing. If the model of incompatibility is chashka nafsho is romantic language and is framed as similar to discouraging polygamy for fear of shortchanging a spouse, then I can appreciate it. I think honestly, by the time you get to the tour, that's a lot of what's going on. Um, there's this sense that like there are kind of two kinds of marriages that are possible. One is a marriage to Torah and one is a marriage to a human being. Um, and then that, that seems like a kind of potential problem. Kelsey, did you want to say something? No, I was just going to say, I mean, as like, it, it's not dissimilar to contemporary debates about like, the division of household labor in families as it is. Um, and like, as somebody, I have two very small kids and on the one hand, it, it is like, it feels aggravating, I guess, to have this bifurcated model. On the other hand, like I've never seen any actual <laughs> solution to this. Like if you have little children, they, it is disruptive. And it's like, oh, it's so nice to think that you might be like learning partial with your kids, but that's not the same as learning it as a on your own as an adult like the way that we're learning it here so like i'll be curious you said that in the third class um to get to um you know attitudes towards um outsourcing domestic labor and childcare because that's the only solution anybody's ever positive to, to the other unless like live in a commune you know those are the options <laughs> and like if number two isn't an option then <laughs> um you know then right you know. right great so yeah so we're definitely going to get to like what does it mean to to kind of outsource this and how do you relate to that people you outsource to and like all of those questions kind of save for for two weeks from now um right but i think the sense of this as an unsolved problem is an important one it's certainly unsolved in american life politically socially economically all those kinds of things um but i think it's also unsolved for some of these sources even even kind of if we step like sort of around the like gender piece, right? Which is one other way that this problem gets quote unquote solved is just to, right? Whoever you outsource to can't be learning when they've been outsourced to, right? So there is, yeah, that that is that is one of the key, the key problems that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about um, in a few weeks. Um, but in the meantime, I just want you to see sort of on the one hand, I think this can feel like it requires a bifurcation of ourselves because we're pulled 
in these two directions. We're pulled by a love of Torah. I think that's why you're all here on an 8, 8 p.m. on a Sunday night, um, at least I hope. And you're also pulled by your domestic responsibilities. And how am I, maybe those two things just like don't have a lot to do with each other. And there's not a lot of like beautiful intellectual work that I can do about the project of washing dishes. In fact, just like I've got to wash the dishes because that's what's going to happen. Um, and maybe there's some other, other kinds of things. So one thing I, I want to kind of lead us to is the sense of this is both an unsolved problem and on the other hand that there are kind of strategies within the tradition for thinking about them. Okay, great. Ozzy, hold your thought about this is why women are not required to learn Torah. We'll get there and we'll kind of complicate that understanding as we, as we go. Um, beautiful. So I want to actually turn to another set of conflicts that are, I would say, loosely connected to the domestic labor con conflicts, um, or the, rather the child, la child care labor conflicts. Um, and I want to turn to them because I think they're more useful for thinking about possible solutions, paths forward, paths that don't work um, in rabbinic sources, because often rabbinic sources are more, especially later, later rabbinic halakhic sources are often super concerned with economic need because that's something that's very like common to their authors, but often less articulate in some ways about childcare. Um, so I wanna use this both as a, as a kind of straightforward case of one of the things that domestic labor sometimes requires is like figuring out how you're gonna put food on the table, um, but also as a kind of model for thinking about other forms of domestic labor. So maybe you're thinking not about like economically, how am I gonna pay for that food, um, they might certainly be thinking about that also, but also, you know, how am I going to cook that food? How am I going to get it onto the table in other ways? So I want to uh, turn to the laws of Talmud Torah in an explicit way, and we're going to look at the Shulchan Aruch. Um, and for those of you who are maybe less familiar with reading the Shulchan Aruch, the Shulchan Aruch comes appended to it with the commentary of the Ramah, Rav Moshe Israelis, um, who will basically tell you what's going on in Ashkenaz. Um, appended to the Shulchan Aruch. And often he'll actually tell you something that's pretty different than what gets codified in the Shulchan Aruch. And this case is no exception. So with that, uh, can I get someone else to read? You all heard a lot of me. I'll read, <coughs> excuse me. Every Jewish man is obligated in studying Torah, whether poor or rich, whether completely healthy or suffering, whether young or very old. Even a poor man who frequents doorways to beg and even one with a wife and children is obligated to set a time for himself to study Torah by day or by night, as it says, and you shall meditate on it day and night. Okay, pause there. So if you had this text alone, what would be your assumption about the relationship between Torah learning and domestic labor broadly conceived? Yeah, that John. though there are other obligations, they can, and that they are obstacles, they can be surmounted. Yeah, good. Right. So there are things you are, there are going to be lots of obstacles. Sometimes you're going to be literally begging for your dinner, but that need not get in the way. Right. And Kelsey's given it even in the chat, is given it even a like more intense formulation. Torah stu study is going to trump all your other obligations. You think that you can get off the hook because you don't have enough to eat for dinner tonight? No. You think you can get off the hook because you have a family to feed? No. This is something you gotta do at this time, every day, no matter what, right? So maybe it's even stronger. It's like, there's no conflict here. There's a clear winner, right? The, the kind of two separate spheres and you got to choose model is based on the assumption that like, there's not a rigid hierarchy. Here there might be a, a potentially rigid hierarchy. Okay. Now we're going to see in brackets. So normally like the Rama is printed in like slightly different text, um, but here's just in brackets. So, you know, this is now the Rama and the Rama is going to say something a little different. Keep going. And in a pressing time, even if he only read Shema in the morning or evening, it is called, it shall not be moved. Yeah. And so that, um, lo ya mush mi picha, Karinan Bey, is the wrist, is the like um, 
first half of the verse from Yoshua, which we're going to see a little bit and we're going to see more thinkers play with, um, that then ends up that he got it to Layla. So he's playing with the first half of the verse and he's like, look, yeah, you need to say it every day. Don't, don't tell me that you got to go, like, you got to go to your Dafyomi shear at 6.30 in the morning and then you got to go to the shear, shear in the evening. That's not the picture that I'm trying to describe to you. The picture I'm trying to describe to you is in fact something much more relaxed. If you say Shema, you're Yotze, you're good to go. So in a way, the Rama is kind of mitigating the, the Mechaber, the author of the Shulchan Aruch's position, right? And saying like, no, you don't have to like set elaborate times. This is actually a pretty straightforward thing. And you don't need to basically, don't, don't try to tell yourself a story about some big conflict because actually saying Kriyat Shema is in the, you know, more straightforward than a more elaborate engagement with Salma Turner. Questions about that? Thoughts about it before we keep going? Great. Okay. Now we're going to go back to the Mechaber, back to the author of Shulchan Aruch, and here's what he's going to say. And one that it is impossible for him to learn because he does not know how to at all, or because of troubles that he has, should support others who study. I find that paragraph problematic. Great. Why? Because I know it's talking about the men, but it th makes me think about women who are holding down jobs and caring for their parents and taking care of many children in sickness and in health and dealing with homework and whatever. And so the idea that just because you have troubles, responsibilities that or don't know how that you don't get to learn it, it I would expect it to say something different like it, the one who does not know how to learn, it is the obligation of the others to teach him. Right, great, right. Like maybe if you don't know how to learn, your first job should be to figure out how. And what's that called? It's called learning, just like everybody else. That, like, right, like if you're doing it right, there's everybody learning something they don't know how to do quite yet and they're going to get better at it. And like, maybe that's a model. So yeah, there is a way, like it seems like what you're saying in a certain way is this lets the, lets the person off the hook too easily. It makes it too easy to say, look, I'm just, I, I'm too stressed. I can't handle it. It's I'm also not good for society. You know, it's like, if you really believe that everybody needs to study Torah, then you believe that everybody needs to study Torah. And instead of creating ways to let people who have a harder time at it off the hook, you would be creating ways to bring them in. Right, so maybe there's a way, okay. Um, yeah, maybe there's a way to let people in. And, and then maybe there's a structural problem that's creating the fact that they're overwhelmed and stressed and all the rest of it. And so the issue isn't like, oh, you know, just, just, just pay someone else to do it. Maybe we need to like deal with the root problem here. And I think, I mean, you hear echoes of that line of thinking in a lot of the American debates about cost of childcare and things like that. Like the problem isn't, you know, this particular subsidy or that one. The problem is a much, much deeper set of issues. Um, I just want to briefly address something Ozzy said in the chat, which is once you, he said, when, when, once you pass 18 and you don't know how to learn, it becomes very hard to learn how to learn. I will confess myself to be such a person. It can be done. The end. Okay. Um, not saying it's easy. It's not, but it can be done. Cool. Great. Um, so now, um, I just want you to see that the shul, that the Rama isn't crazy. So you might have you might have read this Rama and thought, wait a minute, I thought you had to learn Torah every day. Lo and behold, all I have to do is say Kriyachma. Seems easier. Where is he getting that? He's getting that from this Gemara in the Nachot that says Rabbi Yochanan says in Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, even if even if a person recited only the recitation of Shema in the morning and the evening, he has fulfilled the mitzvah of the Torah shall not depart from your mouth. That's all you got to do. Cool. Great. Just so you see that it comes from somewhere. So now I want to see one more Rama, which I think also gives I don't know, Desmond, whether you're going to think this is letting the Rama up. The, the Rama is going to make things kind of worse or better from 
from where the Shulchan Aruch left things. So I want you to keep, keep reading and, and go from there. One should make his Torah fixed and his work contingent and should reduce business and engage in Torah. He should put aside temporary pleasures from his mind and do work all day for his livelihood if he does not have enough to eat. And the rest of the day and the night, he should engage in Torah. And it is a great quality to generate one's sustenance from the work of his hands, as it says, the product of your hands you shall surely eat. Great. Okay. So just to lay on the table what this implies. If you are someone who you need to basically work enough to survive, if that takes you all day, then you should stay up all night learning and do it again in the morning. That's the picture. In a way. Now he, he goes on, he tempers it a little bit, but that's like the initial kind of goal that we're aiming at. So this is not, this, this kind of goes back towards, you know, Kelsey's initial reading. Yeah, when does he sleep? Answer, not very much. Um, basically, I think part of what's underneath this is a, is a suspicion of sleep that you see in a lot of um, sources from this period. They, they're just like, they think that sleep is not, not that important. Um, and also there's a lot of interesting stuff about like the history of sleep and the way that we, we think of sleep all in one block. It was less common in the in pre-modern sources or in the early modern sources. Um, deeper into modernity, it becomes more, more standard. Yes, Vilna Gaon slept like basically never. Um, so yeah, I, I think basically the assumption here is the best model is if you could learn all day, every day, all the time, that would be better. And if you um, could, right? And this goes, that idea goes back way back. The Ramam says, you know, it would be best if you could go through the world as if you were sleepwalking. Um, you would be contemplating God and then, you know, dealing with your family, just like without actually ever thinking about it. That's, that's the Rambam's view at the end of the guide, a very con controversial passage. Okay, fine. So here, basically he said, put aside everything else and spend your whole day learning. This is an extremely high bar and one in which in a certain way, there is still the hypothesis that there's a conflict. But that hypothesis is kind of tempered by the fact that the assumption is there will always be other time. And that other time, you can always make space for learning. I will say that has not been my experience of Torah learning, um, right? Um, even though I'm lucky enough to get to learn from my job a lot of the time, uh, nonetheless, by like learning Lishma, it's not operate according to this principle. This is again, a very male-centered model because a woman who has to work eight hours a day with two hours of commute and unpaid lunch break and, you know, then has all the household work to do. And like you could end up sleeping, not at all, even before you got to Torah study. And also there's no way that the Torah study, I mean, I guess the Torah study could be fixed at two to 6 a.m. Yeah. Right. And what I think is actually important to see here, and this will, we're going to get, we're going to sort of see this, like what I take to be a kind of apologetic line about women's, you know, supposed exemption or exclusion from Talmud Torah is the idea that like women are too busy. But I think the thing that's important to see here is that the Ramah thinks that men are too busy too. And then even, even though they're not doing all the kinds of household labor that we like often think of as gendered female, which was true in the time of the Ramah largely, um, this person is also wildly overwhelmed. And, less, and, and nonetheless, like just makes the time and does not sleep, right? Which is not like, I'm not recommending that you all go home and do this, right? Um, but I think it's worth seeing that even in the kind of deeply male picture of these sort of early modern, late, like late medieval, early modern sources, nonetheless, the case that they think you can learn when you're really busy and really sleep deprived. When he wrote this, was he thinking about people who were poor or people who were rich and had servants and therefore? Maybe oh, I think when he's talking about this, he's thinking about poor people. I think that for a couple of reasons. The first is just like the basic historical reality that like 
Jews and Ashkenaz in his time tended to be quite poor. Um, and part of, I think, what he's actually playing with is that, that in his own mind, like, the Ashkenazi practice is something that has to be kind of hitched to the Shulchan Aruch, part because Shulchan Aruch has gained certain kinds of prominence, but also because at the time, Sephardi Jewry feels a lot more secure. So I think that's part of what he's trying to do. Um, but I think when he's saying, right, um, translation doesn't give it to you as, as clearly, right? But when he says, um, right, if he doesn't have enough to eat, like that's someone who's like, you know, we would say today, living paycheck to paycheck. It's someone who doesn't have enough to meet their basic needs. That's the person he's imagining is doing this. We're going to see also, like, by the time we get to, you know, we'll see some other sources that also engage this kind of pretty intense level of poverty um, as the as the sort of starting point of, like, someone who's under, like, in tremendous pressure. Um, okay, cool. Other comments or thoughts about this? Great. Okay, so the Rocha Shulchan is always a beautiful uh beautiful again 19th century beautiful thinker and one of the things i love about the rosh Shulchan is that he when he codifies something he also has like a really interesting either psychological or sort of semi midrashic reading of why things are the way they are in the halachic text and this piece is no exception um it's kind of long but i'm gonna have people i'm gonna have people person who reads stop as they go along. Can I get someone to read? I'll do it. Great. And therefore, every person in Israel is obligated in the study of Torah, whether poor or rich, whether abled or disabled, whether young or old. Even a poor person who goes and begs in doorways, even with a wife and children, is obligated to set times for the study of Torah day and night as it says, and you shall meditate on it day and night, meaning some during the day and some at night. So far so good, sound very familiar, right? Mm -hmm. Great. And, and even though the simple meaning of the verse is that one should be learning all the time for the entire day and the entire night, as it says, let not this Torah cease from your lips and you shall meditate. Wait, However, pause for a minute. Wait, this is a kind of brilliant reading of this pasuk that we just like let slip by. I think in part because we're so used to saying, you know, versions of it in in Mariv every night. It kind of thing, kind of seems like you're supposed to be saying words of Torah all the time. Forget this, like an hour in the morning, hour in the afternoon, as being too much, right? Or even just little shma, you know, morning and night. Maybe you're supposed to be learning all the time. That in a certain way, I think is the idea, the kind of, let's say exegetical idea behind what the Ramah is trying to do, which is like, you owe Torah all of your time. All of it, for real, right? Like it's, it's worth sort of sitting with that. And the Rocha Shulchan realize, sees that, that impulse. And I think he also sees that impulse in the society around him. And he's like, you know, that can't be what it's what what's supposed to happen. So he has a way of solving the problem. <clears throat> However, this is not possible for a person who struggles to provide for their basic needs. This applies only to some exceptional people in that generation. As the sages of blessed memory say, the Torah was only given to those who ate the manna. And therefore, there will never be a generation as knowledgeable as the generation that wandered in the desert because they were not struggling to provide for their basic needs. But for those like us, there is an obligation to set specific times for Torah, a time during the day and a time at night. Okay. So he's gonna respond to this, um, to this view or this, this like kind of radical reading of the Pasuk from Yeshua by saying, it's not that you have to say to, to be learning all the time. That might be some ideal, but it's an ideal for people who live in a desert and have mana brought to them. And that might be, those might have been the ideal people to receive revelation on Sinai, but they're not 
us. We live in a world where we have to provide for our basic needs. And if we're gonna do that, we need to set aside time for Torah study that isn't taken up by that process of engaging in basic needs. Yeah, Kelsey. Okay, I have a question, um, which might not be very smart, but um, I feel like there's a little tension here between, you know, in Pirkei Avot where when, um, I'm just looking it up right now, uh, Rabbi Gamliel says the, that you shouldn't only have a job and not study Torah, but you should also not only study Torah and not have a job. <laughs> Great. So I, yeah, there, that's, there's a tension there, but he's not saying you shouldn't only study Torah because we need to have a job because we live in the world and we're human. He's saying that we shouldn't only study Torah because only doing that is problematic. Yeah. I mean, I think that he, he I think that he imagines a world, like I, it depends how much you want to lean into this, um, this quote from it, it's in, uh, it's in the Mechilta and it's also in Midrash Tanhuma in like different ways um, of the Torah is only, right, the Torah was given to the people who ate the man. Well, why? It was given to the people who ate the man and not other people because the people who ate the man were like able to concentrate on it and accept it in a way that other people were not. So I think the idea is like, that's not something that's accessible to us in the world. Elsewhere, he says he doesn't think it's a good idea to rely on Stakan he, in order to do that. And he's got like good sources to, to argue that point. Um, although, as you know, there are large swaths of communities that don't operate according to that, that set of norms. Um, but it's nonetheless the case, I think for him, that th there, there was a kind of imagined metaphysical reality where your needs were just taken care of. But it was a kind of it was a miraculous thing that that kind of started and ended and it was something available to Dur Hamidbar that's not available to us. So we have to kind of accommodate ourselves to the realities of life, not living as Dur Hamidbar. And in the same way, you know, we accommodate ourselves to life, life without a Mishkan, we accommodate ourselves to life without the man, which means our food's got to get prepared. And either we can pay someone to do that, in which case we have to earn money, or we can do it ourselves. But either way, it's gonna that that process is gonna compete with with learning. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, great, John. I think that's a really good point. It makes more sense because this is this verse is directed at Yeshua and not as a kind of general view. So there's something right there, there's something about that verse in its original context that's kind of linked to someone in a particular position, a certain kind of leadership, certain kind of you know, intellectual religious leadership as well as political leadership that might be, um, that might be, might be part of it. Although, I don't know. I think if you, if you really press me, would I be like, yeah, shot out of that verse is that Yeshua has to sit there and keep reading the Torah without stopping ever. I would be like, no, that can't be what this verse means, right? But it's, it's, it's interesting to see him entertain that hypothesis. And I think he entertains that reading of the Pasu precisely because he sees people around him who basically think that that's what's supposed to happen. More or less, right? And you know, you sleep enough in order to to make the whole rest of it go. Um, great. So the solution that we get from the Ruch Hashulchan is essentially, if you set aside particular times, that will do the job. That will address, right? So I said this is a kind of unsolved problem from the economic need perspective. Supposedly, even someone under tremendous pressure who's going around literally begging at on people, you know, knocking on people's doors and begging for food, that person can still learn by setting aside particular times, right? You're going to come learn at Trisha Sunday at 8 p.m. for three weeks. You're setting aside particular times. Kala kavod to you. Um, and then that will that will that will sort of square the circle. That'll that'll help you deal with these competing competing needs and interests. This raises the question that's sort of been in the background of what we've been saying uh, for a long time, which is that in the modern period, in the 19th century implicitly, in the 20th century explicitly, we start to see this kind of division or sense of incompatibility become heavily gendered. Um, now, there's obviously that, that 20th century stuff is reading certain strands of the tradition in really interesting ways. 
I recommend to all of you Elizabeth Shanks Alexander's book, uh, Women and Time-Bound Commandments in Judaism, in Tanaitic literature, I think, something like that. I will, I will find the link for you and bring it next week, um, that addresses the sort of history of how all of this happened. But it has become pretty common in some circles to talk about women as too busy to engage in time-bound mitzvah. So one way to explain or understand the apparent um, exemption of women from time bound meets vote is to say that their the demands on their time are simply too great. And I think what's one thing that I want you to see from the previous section is that actually the demands on men's times time is also really intense. But for them, what's suggested as the solution is this setting aside particular times, right? So just so you, you see one version of this, this is Saul Berman writing in tradition, the kind of main uh, YU journal. Um, in 1973. Indeed, the Torah modified the civil and religious demands it made upon women to assure that no legal obligation could possibly interfere with her performance of that particular role, i.e. the role of sort of like child care and household labor may, may endure, may endure of household labor. If a woman elected to discover her fulfillment in relation to her husband and children and in the shaping of a home, no law would stand in the way of her performance of that trust. Now, Berman's kind of trying to walk a narrow tightrope and say that like other things are available because in 1973, you can't get away with saying it to a modern Orthodox audience, you can't get away with saying anything else. Um, but he's nonetheless saying that for Hazel, the reason, the, the so-called reason, uh, uh, women are exempted from time bound commandments is actually because it would having fixed times where you have to do something would interfere with child care. That's the claim that's being made. Okay, so I want you to see that the story is a little bit more complicated, and it's complicated in the following way, right? Here's this this a reminder of this text from Menachot that says all if all you need to do is kriyachma. And for a man, that's sort of good enough, right? Like that, that's, that's something that even someone who's begging for their food can manage to do. But the, the thought is that there's something kind of problematic about women having to do it and would interfere with childcare too much. So I wanna, and maybe we'll, we'll end here, we'll see a little bit of the slanter, but um, Sari Katan Gribitz, who's a, a contemporary uh, Talmud scholar at Fordham, has written a book on time in rabbinic Judaism. And she does a, I'm just going to sort of summarize this argument for you outside. She does an analysis or a comparison between Kriyashma on the one hand and uh, the various kinds of like bidikot or checks that are required for observing Mida. And bidikot are also timed relative to the day. So they, they take place at night in certain kinds of ways. You have to you have to do it in, in very particular time intervals over the course of, you know, and then there's times without throughout a month that are also times that you have to do that. And she's, Gribbett says, look, these two things are actually both ways of regulating time. And in the history of the Talmud, they become gendered. But actually, there's a time bound practice that regulates and shapes time for both men and women in rabbinic literature. They're just different practices and they look different kinds of ways, right? Um, so she'll say, close analysis of Mishnah Brachot's rules regarding the recitation of Shema and tractate Nida's discussion of menstrual purity laws demonstrates that rabbinic sources develop both practices as ones that mark daily time, right? So, and then she'll say, um, Rabbinic laws impose additional practices that transform the biblical concern for maintaining purity writ large into a daily concern that entails, in addition, a ritual performed similar to Shema each evening and morning. So it seems here, right, that if you take her reading, even in the rabbinic imagination, women are capable of engaging in set timed rituals and they mark time through those rituals much in the same way that men do just the rituals look different so i think that opens up the possibility i hope right that lots of different people with lots of different bodies and lots of different demands on those bodies can take recourse in the the tradition sort of standard solution to the problem of how do i meet my basic needs while also engaging in the intellectual exercise of talmud Torah by setting aside particular times to do it. 
Um, we're not gonna see all of the, the Yisrael launcher inside, but I just wanna end by saying that there's one model for this being done, even in 19th century Eastern European Jewry, which is that uh, Yisrael Salanter, the founder of the Musar movement, says that while women are exempt from Talmud Torah, and he thinks also importantly, poor men are exempt in his mind from Talmud Torah, women and poor men are all obligated in what he calls limud musar, in the practice of developing your character through a particular curriculum of study that he develops. And how on earth am I supposed to be able to do that if I am, he uses the metaphor begging for my food or also just downtrodden from the horrible job I have to do, I am gonna set aside particular times. And that's the thing that's gonna make it possible for me to integrate these two things. Right, for me to both experience this intense sense of need on the one hand um, and try to try to meet those needs, and on the other hand, engage in the, the character forming practice of Limud Musar. So there is a model in already in, in rabbinic thought before we get to like 20th century feminist interventions, which are also very important and wonderful, um, that that suggests that Fiatzi team is accessible for everyone, even people under tremendous economic need, and also people who might be kind of in a standard gendered way that uh, that these sources tend to think about it might be really deeply engaged in childcare labor. So um, with that, I think we'll we'll close the official clock, um, but I'm happy to stick around if people have questions or comments they wanna talk through. Um, and next week we'll take a pretty different approach um, looking more at what is the experience of doing household labor actually like and how might it shape the way when you when you do get to set aside those times for for learning Torah? How might the experiences you have in the other parts of your life uh, shape the way you learn? Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, that was a really uh, wonderful start. Um, I see uh, Kelsey has to wash dishes. I do too, also. Say, uh, so do I. Do some tidying. Uh, so um, yeah, I guess I'll uh, um, do that. But first, um, it is, important for me to note uh, to all of you that the annual um, uh, excuse me just a second um, let me just make sure that I'm getting all of this right uh, in the calendar Sorry. Um, I'm going to send again invitations to join as a panelist. People are strongly encouraged to take that. That way you can see, be seen, ask questions. We're also now live on Facebook. Thank you to anyone who is oh my goodness. Or I following am... along on Facebook. Excuse me, I am uh, rifling around. Uh, I see. Okay. Sorry. Um, uh, is the link the same next week? Yes, it is. Um, it will be the same every week, but uh, you'll, you should get uh, an email about it nonetheless. Um, just one second. One more. Um, point of order. So sorry for that's okay. Uh, keeping you. Um, okay. Here we go. I'm sorry.
not sure what. My computer is. Do you want me to see if I can pull up the link? Trouble with. It is all right. Okay, so sorry. Uh, finally, um, next week, uh, so next Sunday, March uh, 27th, um, the 22nd annual Rappaport uh, Family Memorial Lecture is happening. Um, it will be given by uh, Dr. Hanan Gafni. Um, the title is Manishtana, the mission is fifth question. And yes, again, uh, that'll be next, um, next Sunday, March 27th, uh, starting at uh, 12 p.m. Eastern, uh, going until 1.15. Um, thank you for uh, sticking with me uh, through all of the uh, suspense there and uh, looking forward to seeing you uh, next week here with Dr. Zager and also uh, with Dr. Gaffney.